How can I achieve ultimate freedom? Do you mean it as a question or an exclamation? A party platform or a desire to return to one's roots? A desire for independence or the key to freedom from slavery? This video shows how an old Greek philosopher thought about freedom. This philosopher thought that freedom meant living in harmony with nature, owning and controlling oneself, becoming a citizen of the world, wanting only what you know you will get, and many other things. Epictetus was born a slave between the years 55 and 135 AD. Acquired is his Greek name. He worked as a slave in the home of Aetes, a powerful person in Nero's Rome, and later got his freedom. By the time Epictetus shared his ideas about freedom in public, he had been free for many years, but his time as a slave had changed his whole philosophy. It is important to know that everything we do that is truly our own is naturally free, unrestricted and boundless. Freedom is not having the right to be free or being able to move around freely. Freedom is the way of thinking of people who can't be upset or frustrated because their wants and choices are their own and don't involve anything they can't give themselves. Slavery, which Epictetus personally experienced, was the main thing that kept people from being free in ancient Greece and Rome. Slavery, which means being owned and forced to work for someone else, was what gave old freedom its strong positive value and emotional charge. While slaves were awake, their masters tightly controlled their movements with their bodies because they had to do menial tasks. But slaves had minds, just like everyone else, and minds can be free or limited in the same way that bodies can. On the outside, you may be free, but on the inside, you may be a slave to your own mind's controlling wants, emotions, and needs. On the other hand, you might look like you're stuck or even physically bound, but be free from anger and discord inside. You might be so free that you were in charge of your own health and happiness, missing little or nothing that you couldn't provide for yourself. This is what the old Stoic philosopher Epictetus meant when he said that freedom was the most important thing in life. Epictetus opened a school for young men in the fashionable city of Nicopolis in northwestern Greece in the early years of the second century AD. At that time, Nicopolis was a popular middle-class area. Arian Lucius Flavianus was a smart young man who was one of his students. His full name was Arianus, and he was so moved by his teacher's message that he wrote down about eight books worth of Epictetus's lectures on Stoicism, almost word for word. He also wrote what we now call the Eniridion, or Handbook, which is a summary of those lectures. No matter if you live in ancient Rome or modern America, you will feel the feelings he talks about. Fear, anxiety, envy, anger, rage, and loss. In that way, Epictetus doesn't need to be introduced. Even though many of the situations he imagines are like things we've all been through, they also include his own unique setting and the customs of a long time ago. We are in a world with slaves, public baths, outdoor games, and people who make a living telling fortunes. Exile is a risk that Epictetus himself had been through. Imperial Rome and its provinces were run by a very strict and competitive system of posts and people who held them. People were always competing for positions and some of the things they did were look for sponsors, go to parties, and try to impress important people. Epictetus talks a lot about how important it is to stay independent, which makes us think of how his young students, like his reporter Arian, were about to start working in the imperial army or the civil service. He makes it clear that it was a society ruled by men by talking about women and their jobs. The Eniridion, on the other hand, doesn't have a clear gender identity and isn't at all macho. The you and we that Epictetus talks to could be any of us, and there isn't much need to take into account cultural differences. During his lifetime, Rome was a complete dictatorship, with the emperor or Caesar in charge. 
Epictetus doesn't talk much about politics. In this book's three material lectures, he only talks about Caesar once and doesn't talk about any past events. In the full lectures, he talks about past people who didn't give in to imperial requests, but he doesn't say anything about the emperors who were in charge when he was teaching in Greece. Freedom was an important idea to the Stoics from the start, but Epictetus made it even more important, both because he was a slave himself and because the people he was writing to had no chance of having political freedom. Stoicism and freedom. The Stoic school of thought began in Greece near the end of the 4th century BC. Its founders were people who moved to Athens from the eastern Mediterranean. At that time, Athens was not a democracy like it was during Socrates' time, but a client state of the kingdom of Macedonia. Philosophy in Athens changed when the city lost its political independence. Ethics became more focused on the individual. The other major Hellenistic school, Epicureanism and Stoicism, both didn't spend a lot of time thinking about politics like Plato and Aristotle had. The younger philosophers were not interested in politics or laws. They were more interested in their own health and how they could improve themselves. In the beginning of Stoic thought, freedom and slavery were seen more as moral and psychological issues than as social rank markers. This inward turn is clearly shown by this. Zeno, the founder of the Stoic school, said that only smart people can be free, while most people are not only stupid, but also slaves. When you first hear this claim, you might be shocked by how intellectually arrogant it is and how little it cares about the situation of people who are actually slaves. But think about how Zeno's claim changes the way people are judged in a slave-based economy by challenging the usual divide between slavery and freedom. If knowledge is what really defines freedom, then the main load of slavery moves from the outside to the inside, from the body to the mind. And freedom comes from philosophy, not being freed. This strict doctrine says that you are enslaved if you set your heart on something that can't happen, like if your body fails you, or if your emotions and passions control you, or if you base your happiness on things that depend on other people, like money, fame, or just luck. Isaiah Berlin wrote the famous article, Two Concepts of Liberty, in which he explained the difference between the negative idea of freedom from force or not being bothered by other people, and the positive idea of freedom to be or live as one wishes, also known as self-mastery or self-determination. From what we can hear in the next section, Epictetus thought that these two ideas were so connected that they included each other. Our master is anyone who has the power to implement or prevent the things that we want or don't want. Whoever wants to be free, therefore, should wish for nothing or avoid nothing that is up to other people. Failing that, one is bound to be a slave. We could change the second phrase in Chion 14 to say something like, those who want to be free from coercion should limit their wants and dislikes to things they have full control over. How can we be sure that this choice is good for us and the people we hang out with? Why depend on yourself when you could follow the Ten Commandments or some other set of tried and true rules? What should we pick? This brings us back to Zeno's idea that understanding is the core of freedom. He used the Greek word Sophia, which can mean any kind of knowledge, from real skills like carpentry to more abstract subjects like mathematics. Sophia always means good practice of a skill. For Zeno and later Stoic philosophers, the skill in question is the art of living. To put it another way, this art can be thought of as knowing how to live in balance with ourselves and with our social and physical surroundings. Getting or trying to get that knowledge is the job of reason, and according to Stoicism, reason is what sets people apart from animals. Epictetus, as a Stoic master, wrote the works of use that you will hear here that go into more detail about these ideas and how they can be used to guide everyday life. His events include a huge range of things, 
From the everyday things that happen in family and work life to difficult things like illness, poverty and death. It's not clear to Epictetus what the difference is between morals and manners. Everything we are asked to do and think about in Kayan 33 is related to his main question. Should I decide and start on this myself, or should I settle down and accept it without any feelings? The either-or question covers almost every case you can think of because it is based on things I can't change. If someone is rude to you, that's not something you can change, but you can choose how to react to it. Accidents happen, people you care about die, you don't get the job you applied for, and you get sick. None of these things were your fault or were your duty. In each case, though, you have another option. You can see the situation as a chance to use your own judgment and control, rather than seeing yourself as a victim of outside forces, as someone who has been wronged, or as someone who has just been unlucky. It might seem like, get real, grow up, show what you are made of, let it go, and mind your own business, are good short forms for Epicurus's message of freedom. You can find more or less exact translations of these phrases in some of this book's translated materials. The fact that people are familiar with them is due in large part to how ancient Stoicism has affected Western education and thought since Epicurus, Seneca and Marcus Aelius were first brought into European and American culture. Philosophers like these are the ones who made philosophy what it is today, a way of thinking that is peaceful, calm or resigned in the face of trouble. These ways of thinking are out of style right now because they don't fit with the trend for being real, expecting others to do the same, showing how you feel and being sure of yourself. Modern Stoics, on the other hand, have found that these ideas are still useful today, especially in our busy world of social media, sound bites, affirmation, anger, attention-seeking and self-imposed worry. The words, get real, and other similar phrases that we use today have lost touch with their stoic roots. As used by Epicurus, they are suggestions for how people can best live their lives based on the stoic view of nature, psychology, and human ideals. Even though Epicurus's voice sounds friendly and casual, he wasn't a campaigner himself. He made a complicated philosophical subject system more well known. This system, like all real philosophy, was based on strong arguments, internal consistency, and evidence. Nature, from the Greek word physis, is one of his main ideas. For example, the word physics refers to the structure and contents of the physical world. Personality refers to our mental abilities, attitudes, and potentialities. And values refers to the things that people believe are important for a good life and being human. Before you listen to the Enchiridion and the parts of the discourses that I chose, let me quickly go over these three kinds of nature in Stoicism and how Epicurus uses them. Getting along with nature. 1. External nature. Epicurus, like the Stoics, saw the real world as a framework of causes and results that can't be changed. Stoics believe that nothing happens by chance or for no reason, so they think it's silly to complain about natural events that were sure to happen. All events are predetermined by a sensible force, the Stoic God that is present in all things, living and non-living, Enchiridion 31, Discourse 1. 2. Our internal nature is the part of nature that the Stoic God gave us as a chance and a duty. As Enchiridion 53 says, people can either try to understand external nature and act and think in a way that fits with it, or they can try to fight it and end up in situations they can't stop because of natural causes. 3. Human Nature Epicurus talks about the mental tools that adult people need to live freely in nature. He talks about freedom to separate the mind from things we normally think of as basic parts of ourselves, like our bodies and the identities or places we've found in the world. According to him, this extreme simplicity 
lets him see the mind as the only place where people can be completely free, independent and unhindered if they choose to be that way. He says that mind, which he defines as judgment, drive and will, is completely up to us. It really is up to us if we focus on our self-determination and don't let the things the world gives us control our wants and dislikes. Enchiridion 20. Values. The Stoics' extreme categorization of values is at the heart of these ideas about the outside world and people. The following will help you understand this part of their philosophy. Goods are things that are generally good for us, like virtue, knowledge, happiness, mind dependence, and balance with nature. Bad things are usually damaging, our fault, foolishness, sadness, not mind dependent, and out of sync with nature. Indifference means that something is neither essentially good nor bad, and it's not up to us to change it. For example, poverty, wealth. The main idea behind this grouping of values is that what makes someone good or bad is their own thoughts, deeds and character, not something that happens in nature or in the outside world, Enchiridion 6, 19 and 31. This doctrine says that what makes something good or bad is how it helps or hurts us when we choose to act and react in a certain way. The basic meanings of good and bad are still helpful and damaging, but in Stoic thought, the meanings of good, benefit, and bad, harm, are limited by the following standards. Things are only strictly good or bad if they are truly good or bad. For example, wisdom is always and only good for the wise person. Being good is an essential part of wisdom, just as being foolish is an essential part of folly. The rest of the things are neutral, which is what the Greek word adiaphora means, Enchiridion 32. This doctrine makes us think about these things. 1. Are common things like health and wealth always and essentially good for us? 2. Do you need them to be happy? 3. Do they belong to us? 4. Do they rely on your mind? 5. Are they in line with our logical selves? For the Stoics, if the clear answers to all of these questions are bad, then we can't be sure of happiness if we make it depend on getting these things or staying away from the opposites of them. Also, when we let our happiness depend on outside factors, we give up our freedom and calmness and increase the chance of failing and being let down. When we limit goodness and benefit to the mind-dependent traits of virtue and knowledge, on the other hand, we can find happiness that fits with our logical nature and be good at dealing with things we can't change. The harsh language used to explain the Stoic doctrine may make people who are just learning about it think it is not useful or concerned with normal human goals. But there's a lot more to it than what I've said so far. The Stoics agree on one thing. We naturally want to be healthy and wealthy, and we naturally feel bad about things that are the opposite of these. Second, they both agree that we can't live a logical and peaceful life. If we didn't pay attention to these natural tendencies and disinclinations though, natural likes and dislikes would be very different from wants and aversions, which are where we put all of our will and our hopes for happiness in Kayan too. We usually make something a big deal when we want it or don't want it. Epicus tells us not to want health and base our happiness on getting it, but to be thankful for it if it comes our way. The main question then is what the Stoics think is necessary and enough for happiness. Things can go well when things are bad and they can go badly when things are good. A happy life, from this point of view, means fulfilling your nature as a logical animal, which is your heritage and goal. Talk 8 and talk N. What matters in that effort is not luck, getting things we naturally like, or staying away from things we naturally don't like. What matters is making reason our guiding principle in everything. Listeners must decide if and how much they agree with this grouping of values in Kyan 51, whether we are going through hard times or good times. 
The Stoics did a great job of making it clear that the value of things whose causes are not related to our goals or responsibilities was very different from the value of things whose benefits and harms are related to us. The clear difference between the two shows how important it is from an ethical point of view to understand the good and bad things that our actions and feelings directly cause. The ideas that outside events can be kept out of the way of our happiness and directly controlled by our will and wants, on the other hand, are clearly open to being questioned. It's only normal to think that happiness depends a lot on what's going on around them, right? Can the average flawed person like most of us follow the stoic way of life? Epicus may seem harsh and demanding, but as a teacher, his job was to show his students how to reach the stoic goal and not be satisfied with just being normal. He knew that sticking to the set of ideals I had laid out would be the best advice he could get even better than himself. He isn't trying to be a hero, but he is trying to get close to it by using it in everyday situations that bother people and make them less effective. You don't have to agree with Stoic determinism and divine theology in order to study his way of life. However, his respectful attitude toward God in Kayan 31 Discourses 7 is perfect for our time and place. I urge people to have the courage to recognize the key components of these theories in Epicus's application if we understand it as awareness to the benefits of the environment. I've included a list of sources at the end of this study of his theory of nature, freedom and ethics to help you figure that out. The Stoic view of what is good and bad puts them in line with philosophers who believe that a person's will and purpose, not the results of their deeds, should be used to judge their morality. When Epicus talks about this idea in the Enneridion, however, it seems like the main goal is for the agent's own happiness and peace, not for other people. Being so focused on yourself seems to go against caring deeply about the wants of other people. Now, do the Enneridion and discourses show us how to live a decent life, where doing what's right for others is just as important as doing what's right for yourself. Answering this question in a very good way is what Epicus does. There is a stoic view that says, ethics should start with and accommodate our basic human interest in our own good or benefit. If you agree with him that it is in the nature of all living things to avoid things that look bad or cause harm, and to like the look of things that are good or bring benefit, then you agree with Kayan 31. Not because we are naturally kind, but because we want what's best for other people. Epicus needs to show that his message of mental freedom isn't just good for himself, but also good for society and in line with living in balance with human nature in a very broad sense. As people, we gain a lot from not having feelings like anger, fear, jealousy, or envy, as well as from having the traits of calm and self-control. In Chinese 10, calm is clearly good for the tranquil, but it's also good for our families, friends, and co-workers, since bad feelings often lead to rude and angry behavior. In modern society, ethics is usually talked about when rules of behavior are broken, like when someone is acting sexually inappropriately or making a noise that disturbs the peace. Epicus's plan for freedom meets the moral duty to not hurt others. How is it with good moral imperatives, like not hurting other people and giving them care and attention on purpose? Are our desires for freedom and peace enough to make us nice and generous? In the past, Stoic philosophers said that our instincts to protect ourselves are mixed with strong social instincts that start with family and go out to the community and beyond. Epicus doesn't talk about this theory directly in this book, but it's clear that he agrees with it in many places. He assumes that people want to help their friends and country as long as they keep their character. Chiridion 24, 30, 32 and 43 all say the same thing. In this case too, his focus on being free from feelings that hold people back 
comes through strongly. One of his most telling examples is the deadly fight between Aedius' sons, who were both fighting for the throne, Kayan 31.5. In Kayan 3, 7, 11 and 14, his memento mori warnings about his wife and children sound very sad until we think about how common baby mortality and early death were in his time. Rather than being insensitive, they are the greatest possible reminder to take care of our loved ones as long as we are able to. Emotional freedom is at the heart of his message and what it means for us and what we can do is very important from an ethical point of view. In his famous moral letter 51.9, written during the reign of Nero, Seneca said, Freedom is the prize we are working for, not being a slave to anything, not to compulsion, not to chance events making fortune meet us on a level playing field. I translated Epictetus's key word, prohiusis, as free will. As I've said before, free will can also mean choose or decide. He says these things are free by nature because they are ours in Chion 1. So it's clear right away that Epicus thought people had free will. So, does that mean he believed in free will as well? That phrase is famously unclear and hard to understand. Some people take it to mean that the same person in the same position could have chosen to act differently than she does, giving her a real choice about what would happen in the future. This idea is sometimes called inevitable freedom. That's not at all what Epictetus meant. It might seem like he doesn't see any bounds to mental freedom from his strong support of liberty, Discourses 9. But this is too idealistic, like the Stoics who came before him. Epicus accepted fate in Chian 53, which means that from God's point of view, nothing happens without a reason. This includes the things we do. It is already set in stone how everyone's life will go, down to the exact choices and decisions they will make. Epictetus is not interested in the past and chances of our choices, or in whether you or I could have become different people based on how things turned out. What interests him is what we want to achieve with the decisions and wishes we make, and how we use our power of rising, Discourses 4 and 6. If someone wants to be free, they shouldn't want anything or avoid anything. That's up to other people in Kayan 14. Of course, most of us are much more direct in what we want. We blatantly risk being ruled by luck and setting goals that can't be reached. Epicus says that when people act in this way, they often give up the free will that is their natural and best quality. Freedom of will, in this sense, meaning not wanting anything that isn't up to you, is not a normal part of being human. It's a hard intellectual achievement. People who have this state of mind and personality don't get angry or let down easily, and they can do whatever they want because they don't want anything that they can't get. Epicus. When I translated Epictetus, I tried to keep the difference between his old Greek and modern English as small as possible. This is mostly easy because he writes in a casual style and uses short lines that fit with current language. It's easy to find daily words that mean the same thing as most of the words he uses. This is how we are taught to write. He does use some technical terms that come from intellectual language. As I explain in the dictionary, these words can be translated in different ways. For example, proheresis by will or fantasia by impression can be translated in different ways. Listeners of this or any other version should care less about word-for-word -word accuracy and more about getting as close as possible to the original's ideas and intentions. It was common for Epicus to use single masculine names to make statements at the time, but he doesn't use them in a way that makes them clearly male. When I can, I show that balance by changing the Greek words for he or him as they or them. The problems I've had translating Epicus aren't with words, they're with style and argument. At first glance, his Greek seems clear and easy to understand, but these traits don't just come out of nowhere. 
the Eniridion always has contrast, balance, and flow. It also always has imperatives, number groupings of sentences, alliteration, and internal rhyme. It is hard to get all of these things across in a natural version. I want to get a hold of enough of them so that you can connect, not with my mind, but with Epicus' mind. I've learned a lot from looking at all the past versions. Everything about them is an accurate copy of the original. The numbers tell you when they were written, but the style isn't always the same, since being new for its own sake. Shouldn't an interpreter be good at this? Sometimes the words I choose are the same as those used by someone else, and I encourage people who read this book to do so. It's interesting to remember that Elizabeth Carter was the first person to translate all of Epictetus into English. Before William Oldfather's Lope translation from 1925 to 1928, her work was the standard. Robin Hard's Everyman version, 1995, is based on it. The great Arian, whose works we owe a lot to Epictetus, says that the Eni Ridian is a collection of Epictetus's talks that are the most relevant and important to philosophy at the time, as well as the ones that move people the most. Simplicius, a Platonist scholar and Aristotle critic, wrote this information about the book in the 6th century AD. He used it out of time as an introduction to Platonism in his commentary. During the height of medieval monasticism, the Eni Ridium was changed to meet the needs of Christians. At least 59 Greek texts show how famous the work was in its early years. Eni Dan is not a book title that Arian came up with. Kai in Greek means hand, so Eni Dan literally means a little thing to hold in the hand. Someone from the Epicurean school of thought had used the word to talk about a useful group of topics. When Arian chose the word Eni Dan for his collection of Epictus, he probably meant something like handbook or manual, but I like to use the Greek word in its original form. A hand knife or sword is what Eni Dan means. Arian may have wanted to make that implication about the work's role as a defense or shield. It fits with his advice at the beginning and end of the text to keep Epictetus's word on hand, which is a clear reference to Erasmus. In 1501, Erasmus put out a Latin book called Encian Milites Christiani, which means a Christian soldier's manual. The Eni Ridian is divided into 53 parts. Some are very short, 37, 41, and 50 words, while others are longer, 23, 24, and 29 words are writings, and 33 words are a long list of do's and don'ts. Each part stands on its own, but the collection as a whole has a clear organization. The first sentence, which lists the things that are up to us and not up to us, clearly introduces and explains. The hall ends with item 53, which has a wise quote. Around the middle, in section 22, Epictus changes the subject from general tips on how to find freedom and peace to specific advice for people who want to become philosophers. He doesn't call these places Stoic, most likely because he isn't interested in schools. Instead, he wants to follow the way of life that any philosopher worth the name should follow, a way of life that is hard and strict, but also humble and understated. But some of these later parts, 36, 42, 45, 49 and 52, refer to specific Stoic ideas and words, which I explain in the dictionary. This book has parts of Epictus's talks that you can read. In these, he often writes in a conversational way. Part 24 of the Eni Ridian is written that way, and part 29 pretty much copies Discourses chapter 3.115 word for word. But in general, the Eni Ridian is stronger and less open to debate than the Discourses. Remember that. You need to do that, etc. Still, when the parts are listened to in order, a unified philosophy of life becomes clear. This philosophy is based on the first ideas about the freedom that the Stoic view of nature offers. I tell people to look for the hidden reasons Epictus uses all the time by using conditional sentences like, if you want this, 
then that will happen, etc. In contrast to many other old Greek books, Epictetus's work has not been seriously tainted or mistranslated. In most ways, my version of the Enai Ridian is the same as Old Father's Greek text from the Loeb Classical Library edition 1925-1928, which was based on Shankel's edition from 1916. The text from Old Father is used here with approval from Harvard University Press. The edition of Boa, 1999, is sometimes what I do. Every time I translate a word or line from the discourses, I use the exact same text from the Loeb Classical Library. One, there are things in the world that we can change and things that we can't. In short, our judgment, drive, desire and dislike are all things that we do on our own. No, our bodies and property, our identities and our legal places are not up to us. In short, we are not responsible for anything that is not our own doing. Also, things that are up to us are naturally free, unrestricted and unhindered. Things that aren't up to us, on the other hand, are weak, subservient, restricted and not ours. Remember this. Then you will be angry, hurt and troubled if you think that things that are usually obedient are free and things that aren't ours are ours. You will also blame gods and people, but if you believe that you only own what is rightfully yours and not what isn't, which you don't, then no one will ever try to stop you or put pressure on you and you won't find fault with or blame anyone for anything. You will do everything willingly. Nobody will hurt you, so you won't have an enemy. Bad things won't happen to you. So remember that if you want to reach such big goals, you need to be pretty driven. Some things you have to skip totally and others you have to put off for now. But if you want both at the same time, the things that are rightfully yours plus fame and money, you probably won't get even the money because you want the fame and money too. You also won't get the things that are rightfully yours, which are the only ways to be free and happy right now. Then make it a habit to tell every bad thought or feeling, you're just a look and in no way the real thing. Then look at it and test it against these rules you have. First, does it have to do with things we can control or things we can't? Then, if it comes up with something that's not our job, be ready to say, not my business. Second, remember that desire means getting what you want and aversion means avoiding what you don't want. Not getting what we want makes us unhappy, while meeting what we don't want makes us sad. That is, you will not experience any of the things you don't want if you limit your dislike to the things that are out of your control. But you will be unhappy if you don't like being sick, dying, or being poor. So, turn our dislike away from things that aren't our responsibility and toward things that are our responsibility that are against nature. On the other hand, give up all desire for now. If not, you will be stuck with bad luck if you want any of the things that aren't up to us. But you won't be able to get any of the things that are up to us, which is fine to want. Focus on inspiration and disinclination and use these traits lightly, cautiously and without putting too much effort into them. Third, Remember to tell yourself what everything that interests you, serves a purpose, or makes you happy, is like starting with the smallest things. It's okay if the jug breaks if you say, I am fond of a jug. Say that you are kissing a person when you kiss your little kid or your wife. That way, you won't have to worry if one of them dies. In the fourth step, whenever you are about to do something, remind yourself of what it is. When you go outside to take a bath, think about the rude people who splash you, push you, talk over you, or steal your things at a baths. Say to yourself before you start the activity, I want to bathe and I also want to keep my will in harmony with nature. Do this before every activity. You can then say, well, this wasn't the only thing I wanted. I also wanted to keep my will in harmony with nature. I shall not do that if I get angry about what is happening. 5. 
People are bothered by how they feel about things, not the things themselves. The idea of death is not scary. If it were, Socrates would have thought the same thing. But what's really scary is the thought that death is scary. Therefore, whenever we are angry, upset or hurt, let us never blame anyone but ourselves, that is, our own thoughts. People who aren't educated blame others when they're doing badly, while people who are learning blame themselves. But someone who is fully educated doesn't blame anyone, not themselves, nor anyone else. Sitting down, don't brag about a difference that isn't your own. If the horse that is preening said, I am beautiful, that would be fine. When you brag, like, I have a beautiful horse, you should admit that you are bragging about something good about the horse. Then what is yours? The handling of first impressions. In other words, you should preen yourself whenever your way of doing this is in tune with nature. That way, you'll have something good that is uniquely yours to enjoy. On a trip, if you get off the boat while it's at rest to get water, you might be able to pick up some shellfish and vegetables along the way. But keep your eyes on the boat and keep turning around in case the captain calls. And if he calls, you have to drop everything so you don't get tangled up and put on board like the sheep. It's the same way in real life. It won't bother you if you get a little wife and child instead of a little veggie and crab. However, when the master calls, you quickly leave everything behind and run to the boat. If you are old, don't go too far from the boat in case he calls and you aren't there. Keep this in mind. Don't wish things to happen the way you'd like them to. Instead, ask them to happen the way they do. 9. Being sick can slow down the body, but not the will, unless the will wants to be slowed down. Being lame can stop the leg, but it can't stop the will. If you keep telling yourself this, you'll find that something else is getting in the way, not you. 10. No matter what, remember to look inside yourself and ask what tools you have to deal with these issues. Self-control is the right power to use when you see a good-looking person. If you're in pain, you'll learn to endure it. If you are rude, you will find kindness. If you make these habits, you won't let first views get the best of you. 11. Never say, I lost it. Instead, say, I returned it. Has your little child died? It was given back. Has your mom passed away? She has been given back. Someone stole my land, you say. No, that was also returned, but the person who did it was bad. While you were worried about the person, the giver used to ask for their money back. As long as these things are given to you, treat them like they are not yours, like how visitors treat their place to stay. 12. If you want to move forward, don't believe this kind of thinking. If I don't take care of my business, I won't have any money. Or, if I don't punish my slave, he won't do anything good. It is better to die hungry while being calm and sure of yourself than to live worryingly when there is plenty. Also, it's better for your slave to be bad than for you to be sad. Let's start with small things, like oil getting spilled or wine being stolen. Next, tell yourself, this is the price I pay for not getting upset. This is the price for peace. Nothing is free. When you call on your slave, remind yourself that he can choose not to answer, or, if he does, he can choose not to do any of the things he wants. Anyway, he's not important enough for your peace of mind to count on. Feel free to look stupid and dumb on the outside if you want to make progress. You don't need to look like an expert, even if some people think you are one. It's hard, but trust yourself. You can keep your own will in balance with nature and protect outer things at the same time. But if you care about one, you will forget about the other. You're crazy if you think that your kids, wife and friends will always be safe. You want things to be your responsibility when they are not, and you want things to be yours when they are not. If you want your slave to never make a mistake, you are just as stupid because you want weakness to be something other than a flaw. But if you don't want to be let down by your wants, this is something you can do. 
then work on this power you do have. Anyone who has the power to make things happen or stop them from happening is our master. That means that if you want to be free, you shouldn't want or avoid anything that other people can do. If not, you will have to be a slave. Remember that you should always act like you're at a fancy dinner. When something comes up to you, put out your hand and politely take a piece. Don't try to stop it. It goes on. It hasn't come yet. Don't let your hunger get the best of you. Wait until the amount gets to you. You will one day be able to eat with the gods if you treat your kids, your wife, your family, your job, and your money this way. Don't even take things that are put in front of you. Just walk right by them. Then you will not only eat with the gods, but also follow their rules. That's why Diogenes, Heracles, and other people like them were called holy and earned to be called that. Be careful not to think that someone is in terrible physical or emotional trouble when you see them grieving over the death of a child or the loss of property. Instead, think this. What is crushing these people is not the event itself, because for some people it's not, but their thoughts about it. Don't be afraid to show your sympathy and maybe even join in with their groans, but be careful not to moan yourself. Remember that you are a character in a play that is exactly how the director wants it to be. It's short if that's what he wants, or long if that's what he wants. For example, if he wants you to play a poor, make sure you do it well. If he wants you to play a king, an official, or a private person, you should also do a great job with the part you were given. The part, on the other hand, is chosen by someone else. When the raven croaks a worrisome sound, don't let it affect you. Instead, be clear-headed and tell yourself, this isn't a warning to me. It only affects my weak body, my small estate, my chicken reputation, my children, or my wife. But for me, any estimate is good if I want it to be, because I stand to gain from the result, no matter what it is. You can always win if you only enter contests where you have the chance to win. Watch out not to assume that someone is happy just because they are admired, powerful, or respected in some other way when they are in a position of honor in front of you. Because there is no room for envy or jealousy if what makes us good is things that are up to us. You will not want to be a praetor, a senator, or a governor. You will want to be free. We can only do this if we hate the things that aren't our responsibility. Remember that the people who are rude or violent are not what hurts you. It's how you think they hurt you. So the next time someone irritates you, remember that it's your own bad reasoning that's making you angry. First, try not to let the idea get the best of you. You will be able to better control yourself after you take a break and give yourself time. Keep death exile, and anything else that looks bad in front of your eyes every day. After that, you won't think mean things or care too much about anything. People will laugh at and make fun of you if you're interested in philosophy at first. They will say things like, what do you know? Now he's back as a philosopher. Where did he get the look of being so smart? Don't look that way then. Instead, Hold on to your ideas of what is best as someone God chose to be in this position. Remember that the people who used to make fun of you will now respect you if you hold on to those beliefs. On the other hand, if you break them, you will be laughed at again. If you ever feel like you need support from other people to get along with them, you know you've gone astray. This means you should be happy just being a philosopher. If you want other people to see you that way too, then that's enough. Do not worry that your life will be without honor and that no one will care about you anywhere. If not having honor is a bad thing, then you are the only one who can be responsible. Any more than other people could make you look bad. Position, you don't really think it's your job to get a government job, do you? Or be asked to a feast? No, of course not. So how is this still a lack of honor? How are you going to be a nobody everywhere if you need to be a somebody only when it's up to you? You can be a great person in them, but your friends won't have any help. 
What does it mean to lack support? They will not get any money from you, and you will not become Roman citizens. Who told you that these things are somebody else's business and not ours? Who can give someone something they don't have? Someone tells you to get money, so we can also have it. Anyone can show me the way to get what I want, as long as I keep my respect, ethics, and morals. That being said, you can see how unfair and mean you are if you want me to give up the good things I have so you can get bad things. Have you ever thought about having money or a friend you can trust? You should help me keep this character and not ask me to do things that will make it go away. Someone says that my country will not get the help that I could have given it. I'll ask you again what kind of help you have in mind. Because of you, your country will not have colonnades or public pools. What does this mean though? Because of the blacksmith and the tailor, your country does not have shoes or guns. It's fine if everyone does their own thing. Furthermore, wouldn't you be doing your country a favor by giving it another honest and trustworthy citizen? I would, yes. In that case, you would be helpful to your group. Then what role will I play in it? Neither one is better than the other, as long as you stay honest and trustworthy. But what good are you if you lose this character because you want to help your country and become dishonest and unreliable? The person who was put in front of you at a dinner, in line at the front desk, or when you were called in as a counsellor, should make you happy if they are good. Don't be mad that you didn't get them if they are bad, though. Remember that you can't expect to get the same amount of things that aren't our responsibility if you don't do what other people have done. You can't have the same amount of respect from someone as someone who hangs out at their door, walks around with them, or rubs their back. To get these things for free, you should pay for them. If you don't, you're being greedy and stupid. What does lettuce cost? Maybe an OB. Don't think you have less than someone who pays an OB and gets the lettuces. You have the extra OB while he has the lettuces. When we look at these cases, it's the same. One person didn't ask you to their dinner party because you didn't pay for the food. He sells it to get notice and to show off. Then, if you think it's worth it, pay the price that it's listed at. You are greedy and stupid if you want to get it without paying for it. Are you not having anything for dinner? Yes, you do. You don't have to deal with the crowd outside his door or flatter the man you didn't want to impress. We can learn about nature's meaning from things that everyone agrees on. If someone else's slave breaks their master's drinking cup, everyone is ready to say, it was just an accident. When your own cup breaks, remember that you should be the same way you were when it happened to someone else's cup. Now use this rule for more important things. People often say, that's just life, when someone else's child or wife dies. But when a family member dies, people immediately say, alas, poor me. We should remember how we feel when this happens to someone else. It's not possible to miss a goal, and nothing that happens in the world is bad by nature. You would be very angry if someone on the street were given your body, but you let anyone who insults you mess with your mind and make it feel bad. Don't you feel bad about that? Before starting any project, you should look at what led to it and what will happen as a result. Only then should you start the project itself. You will start off excited because you haven't thought about any of the next steps, if you don't do that. Then when things get hard, you'll give up and feel bad about yourself. Would you like to win the Olympics? Of course I do too, because it's a great thing. Don't start the job until you've looked at it from beginning to end. You have to work out every day, follow a strict diet, avoid sweets, and do the same exercises every day, summer or winter. You also can't drink cold water or wine at certain times. To put it another way, you have to give up control to the trainer, just like you would to a doctor. During the real battle, you have to fight with the other people and possibly break your hand or ankle. You also have to swallow a lot of sand, get beaten and lose the fight. Go compete if you still want to after you've thought about this. But if you don't think first, you'll be like kids who play wrestling for a while, then gladiators, then trumpeters and finally actors on stage. 
You are now like that too, an athlete, then a warrior, then a speaker, and now a philosopher. But not in yourself as a whole. As quickly as something strikes your fancy, you act like a monkey and copy what it sees. You haven't gone after anything after giving it careful thought or reviewing it carefully. You don't care about anything and just mess around. It's why some people want to become philosophers after seeing or hearing a philosopher speak like Euphrates, even though no one else can really talk like him. Dear man, first think about what it's like and then look at yourself to see if you can handle it. Are you really interested in wrestling or the pentathlon? You should look at your arms, legs and hips if that's the case. Different people are naturally good at different things. Can you go to philosophy class and eat and drink the same way you do now? Will you still get angry and irritated? People in the street will make fun of you. A young slave will treat you badly and you will look worse in rank, office or trial. You won't be able to sleep or see your friends and family. In fact, everywhere. After you've thought about all of this, decide if you want to trade it all for peace and freedom. Don't even think about philosophy if not. Don't play like kids. First be an intellectual, then a tax collector, then a speaker, and finally a royal official. These jobs don't go together. You can only be one person, good or bad. Either you need to work on your leadership skills or on things outside of yourself. You should work on either the inside or the outside, which means you should act like either a scholar or a normal person. Our social relationships shape what we should do most of the time. When it comes to a father, this means taking care of him, letting him have his way with everything and not complaining if he is violent or cruel. What if he's not a good dad? Do you believe that you naturally want to be a good dad? Not to a father though. Let's say your brother is mean to you. In that case, keep your friendship with him as a brother. Don't think about why he acts that way. Instead, think about what you need to do to keep your will in line with nature. In fact, no one will hurt you without your permission. You will only be hurt when you believe you are. Make it a habit to look at your ties with your friends, other people in the community, or army leaders. That way, you'll know what to do. Being respectful of the gods means first having the right ideas about their presence and how they run the world in a fair and good way. The second thing you should do is prepare to follow them and accept whatever happens. Do what they say, because you know that what happens was planned by their awesome choice. You will never be able to fault the gods or say they didn't do their job this way. For that to work though, you have to take away the good and bad from things that aren't our responsibility and only give them to things that are. If you think any of those other things are good or bad when you don't get what you want or run into something you don't want, you will have to blame the gods and hate them for it. It is in the nature of all living things to avoid things that look bad or do bad things and to love and seek out things that are good or bring good things. You can't enjoy something that makes you feel like you're being hurt any more than you can enjoy being hurt itself. Sons will insult their dads if they don't give them things they think are good. It was A and Polonius's shared view that having complete power is good that made them dislike each other. For the same reason, dads, fishermen, traders and men who have lost their wives and children also curse the gods. Wherever people are interested is also where they show respect. So, if you are careful to put your wants and dislikes where they belong, you will also be careful about respect. Still, everyone is welcome to follow faith practices and give gifts as long as they do so with a good heart and not in a robotic or careless way, nor should they be mean or wasteful. Remember that you don't know exactly what will happen when your wealth is taken. That's why you went to see the fortune teller. But if you're a real philosopher, you already know what kind of thing it is. Because if it's not up to us, it can't be either good or bad. So don't put your wants or fears onto the fortune teller. If you do, you will be very anxious when you go to him. Before you start though, know that no matter what happens, 
it doesn't matter what happens because it's a chance that you should take full advantage of with no one getting in your way. So, ask the gods to help you and go with confidence. Next, when someone gives you advice, think about who you're listening to and who you're ignoring. Socrates thought that fortune-telling was the best way to deal with situations. The point of the question is to find out what will happen when neither reason nor any other method can tell you what you are facing. You should not talk to a fortune teller about things that could put your life in danger for the sake of a friend or your country. It doesn't matter if the fortune teller says the signs are bad. All that is clearly predicted is death, physical harm or being sent away. Reason says that you should still help your friend and take chances for your country, even in this situation. Also, pay attention to Apollo, Pythia and the Great Seer. The man who didn't help his friend when he was being killed was thrown out of the temple. Make up a clear character and identity for yourself right now. You will stick to it whether you are with other people or by yourself. Keep quiet most of the time or talk as little as possible. Talk sometimes though, when the case calls for it. But don't talk about boring things that come up all the time, like gladiators, horse races, sports, food and drink. Also, don't say bad things, good things, or negative things about other people. By what you say, if you can steer your friends' conversations in the right direction, but if you're by yourself with strangers, don't say anything, don't laugh a lot or all the time, do not take a promise at all, or if that is not possible, do not take it as much as you can. Take a break from going to dinner parties hosted by people who are not in your group, but if you have to, be very careful not to follow their lead. When someone is with someone crude, it will show on that person, even if that person is polished. Food, drink, clothes, a place to live, and staff are all things that a body needs. Take only what you need and leave out anything that is just for show or luxury. If you want to get married, try to avoid having sex as much as possible. If you do go for it, don't do anything that is considered rude. If other people are having sex, don't get in the way or judge them for it. Also, don't brag about your stay clean. Someone telling you bad things about you don't fight back against the story, but you should say, obviously he didn't know my other flaws or he would have brought them up too. You don't need to make a big deal out of going to the public game, but if the chance comes up, don't show support for anyone other than your own side. In other words, you should want the outcome to be exact and the winner to be the exact person who wins. In this way, you won't be let down. Don't yell or laugh at anyone and don't get too involved. After you've gone away, only talk about the things that happened that helped you get better. If you don't, people will think you were impressed by the show. Don't just show up to public talks without giving them much thought. But when you do go, be politi, take it seriously, and don't bother anyone. Before you meet someone, especially someone you think is important, think about what Socrates or Zeno would have done. After that, you won't have any trouble solving the situation correctly. Also, when you call a high-level official, think that he won't be home, that the door will be slammed in your face, and that he won't pay attention to you. But if you still have to go, don't tell yourself that it wasn't worth it. Just accept it and go. That's what a normal person, someone who is upset about something, would do. Don't talk too much about your own adventures or deeds when you're with other people. It may be fun for you to talk about them, but other people aren't as interested in hearing about your experiences. Don't try to be funny either. This kind of behavior can easily turn rude and it will also likely make your neighbors dislike you. Also, you should be told not to start a sexual talk. Should this happen, you should scold the person who started it if you can find the right time. If not, stay quiet, blush and frown to show that you don't like the talk. You should be careful not to let the thought of pleasure take over your mind, just like you should be careful with all thoughts. Take a break 
and let the thing wait a bit. First, think of the time when you will enjoy the pleasure. Then, think of the time when you will feel bad about what you did and be angry with yourself. Now compare them to how happy and satisfied you will be if you don't do it. But if you think now is a good time to start the affair, make sure you're not getting too caught up in its sweetness, charm and allure. Picture how much better it feels to know that you've won this battle. If you think something should be done, don't try to hide the fact that you just did it. If what you're going to do is bad, don't do it at all, even if most people don't agree with you. But if it's right, why worry about people who criticize it wrong? The statements, it is day and it is night, can be put together to make a proper disjunctive sentence. Either it is day or it is night. In contrast, saying both it is day and it is night is not an acceptable sentence. In the same way, at a dinner party, picking the bigger share might be better for your body, but less good for keeping up the social vibes that the event calls for. Not only should you think about what the food is good for you, but you should also think about how to show your friend respect. If you've taken on a part that you're not up to, you've put yourself down and missed out on a job that you could have done well in. When you walk, you watch out not to step on a nail or twist your ankle. You should be just as careful not to hurt your ability to lead. We will be safer doing what we are doing if we follow this rule in everything we do. Like the foot is the right size for a shoe, the body is the right size for each person's stuff needs. You will keep the measure if you follow this rule. Going past that line, on the other hand, will lead you to fall off a cliff. The shoe is the same. If you go over the foot, a golden shoe will come first, then a purple one with embroidery. Once you go over the line, there is no going back. Men call girls ladies when they are 14 years old. Since the only thing they can hope for is to go to bed with them, they start to get ready and put all their hopes on how good they look. They need to learn that the only way to really be recognized is to look classy and humble. People who spend most of their time on physical processes like exercising, eating, drinking, going to the bathroom and copulating are thought to be rough. These things should only be done by chance. Your full attention should be on your mind. Remember that when people are mean to you or criticize you, they are just doing or saying what they think is right for them. You can't tell them what to do, they can only follow their own thoughts. That means that if their opinion is wrong, they are the ones who are hurt because they were wrong. There is no harm done to the statement when someone thinks it is wrong, only to the person who made the mistake. If you start from this point of view, you'll be nice to people who criticize you and keep telling yourself that's what they thought. Every situation has two handles, one that makes it possible to support and one that makes it impossible to support. If your brother treats you badly, don't focus on the bad treatment. That's an unhealthy way to look at it. Instead, focus on the fact that he is your brother and the boy you grew up with. Then you'll hold on to the situation in a way that makes it possible to do so. I am better than you because I am richer than you and I am better than you because I am more eloquent than you are not valid inferences. However, I am better than you because my property is better than yours or I am better than you because my addiction is better than yours are valid inferences. But you are neither property nor addiction. You shouldn't criticize someone for taking a bath quickly. Instead, you should say that they do it quickly. You shouldn't tell them they're wrong for drinking a lot of wine. Instead, just say that they drink a lot. How can you tell if they did something wrong until you know why they did it? In this way, you won't mix your sure feelings about a situation with your support for something else that isn't so sure. Do not ever call yourself a philosopher or talk a lot about your intellectual ideas with regular people. Just follow what the rules say. For example, don't talk about table manners at a dinner party, just eat nicely. Keep in mind that Socrates was so humble that people would come to him and ask him to present them to philosophers. 
he would do so. So little did he care that no one noticed him. If the topic of talk shifts to philosophy, it's best to keep quiet because you might blurt out something you haven't fully thought through. If you stay quiet and don't say anything, people will think you are ignorant, and that is a real step forward in your mental journey. Sheep don't show how much they've eaten by giving their food to the farmers. Their bodies break it down, and then they make wool and milk. This means that you shouldn't show off your philosophical ideas to regular people. Instead, show them what you do when you follow those ideas. Don't act fancy about your cheap lifestyle once your body is used to it. Also, don't always say that you only drink water. And if you ever want to do stamina training, don't do it for other people to see. Do it for yourself. Be careful not to be seen outside hugging statues. You can drink cold water and spit it out without telling anyone if you are really thirsty. A normal person will never look for help or harm within themselves. They will only look for it from things outside themselves. One thing that philosophers always say is that they are only looking for help and harm from themselves. If someone is making progress, they won't criticize or praise anyone, blame or accuse anyone, or say anything about themselves that makes it sound like they know something or are someone. When this kind of person is upset or slowed down, he blames himself. When someone compliments him, he laughs to himself at that person. And when someone criticizes him, he doesn't fight back. He moves around like a patient, being careful not to hurt any of his sore limbs before they are fully healed. He's gotten rid of all desire and turned his dislike toward the things that are usually bad for us. He is calm about everything that drives him. He doesn't care if he seems stupid or simple-minded. To put it another way, he keeps an eye on himself as if he were his own enemy building an attack. When someone is proud of being able to understand and describe Christ's books, tell yourself, if Copus hadn't written so badly, they would have nothing to be proud of. How about me? What do I want? I want to learn about nature and do what it says. Because of this, I need someone to help me understand nature. When I learn that Copus can do that, I go to him. But I don't understand what he writes, so I'm looking for someone who can help me understand them. I have nothing to be proud of so far. Even once I've found the translation, I still need to follow the rules. That's the only thing to be happy about. To be clear, I am not a philosopher. What interests me is the act of analyzing. I am now a literary researcher, but I am studying Copus instead of Homer. Therefore, when someone asks me to explain Copus, I don't feel proud. Instead, I blush because I can't act in a way that fits his state. Do not break these rules in any of your projects. It would be wrong to do so. Also, don't pay attention to what other people say about you. It's not your business. How long will you wait before you believe you deserve the best and let reason guide your decisions in everything? You were given the ideals you should support and you have done so. So, what kind of teacher are you still looking for so you can fix yourself in front of him? No longer a boy, you are now a full-grown man. And if you're careless and lazy right now and always putting things off until tomorrow or the next, you won't realize that you're not making any progress and will just live your life like everyone else until you die. Think of yourself as good enough to live as an adult making progress right now and make your idea of what's best the rule you never break. And no matter what happens, whether it's good or bad, famous or not, remember that right now is the battle, the Olympics, and you can't put it off any longer. One day and one action can make or break your progress. This is how Socrates improved himself. He focused on nothing but reason in everything he did. Even though you're not Socrates yet, you should live like you want to be one. The first and most important part of philosophy is putting the ideas into practice, like not lying. It's in the second area that they talk about their reasons, like why people should not lie. Third, there is the area that checks and studies the proofs. For example, it looks into what makes this a proof, 
what a proof is and what validity, contradiction, truth and untruth are. This means that the third area is needed because of the second and the second is needed because of the first. That being said, the first one is the most important and where we should stay. Not only do we not do the opposite, but we spend all of our time and energy on the third area and totally ignore the first one. This makes us lie, even though we know we shouldn't and are ready to show proof. At all times, you should have the following quotes in your hold. Lead me, O Zeus, and you, O destiny, wherever you have ordained for me, I will follow unflinching. But if grown bad, I should refuse, I will follow nonetheless. Whosoever complies nobly with necessity, we count as wise and knowing things divine. Well, Crito, if my death is pleasing to the gods, so let it be. Anitus and Miletus, Socrates' Athenian prosecutors can kill me, but they cannot harm me. From the Discourses This part of the work is a version of nine passages from three of Epictetus's four greater books of Discourses. There are almost 100 things in these books, ranging in length from about 20 pages of a modern book to less than one page. The longest piece, from which I took sections 3 and 4, is just called On Freedom. This title was used by Arian, or a later editor, and it's a good one. In both the talks and the Enchiridion, the theme of freedom comes up over and over again. I gave each of these pieces a title to show how Epictetus dealt with his favorite theme in more than one way. There were two main reasons I chose this passage. First, to add to the Enchiridion with more philosophical ideas, and second, to give readers an idea of Epictetus's dialogue style. The talks are necessary to fully enjoy Epictetus, but Arian did just as well taking the useful information from them to make the Enchiridion, which is a small classic. It's portable, and if you're like me, the powerful message will make you think, feel energized, and even feel better. It is important to learn to want everything as it happens. Someone who is getting educated should ask themselves, how can I follow the gods in everything? What can I do to be happy with the holy administration? How can I get free? You are free as long as nothing happens that goes against your will and no one can stop you. What does it mean? Do you mean to say that freedom is crazy? Of course not. Being free and going crazy don't go together. But I want all of my dreams to come true, no matter how crazy that sounds. You're really upset. You're going crazy. Do you not understand that freedom is a great thing? Being so wishy-washy that you want all of your whims to come true is the exact opposite of fine and is completely unacceptable. Think about how we would do it with the numbers. Would I like to write the name die however I want? No, I've been told how to write it correctly. What does it sound like in music? The same. This is usually the case when some kind of skill or knowledge is involved. Otherwise, there would be no point in learning anything if information were changed to fit everyone's needs. So, is this the only place where I can be wishy-washy when it comes to freedom, the best and most important thing? Not at all, because learning to want things to happen the way they do is exactly what schooling is all about. How do they take place? In the way that the person who put them together put them together. In order for the world to be in balance, he set up summer and winter, plenty and death, virtue and vice, and all other opposites. In addition, he gave each of us a body, body parts, land, and other people. After being aware of this system, we should go on to education, not to change the circumstances, because we can't and it wouldn't be better if we could, but so that we can keep our minds in tune with what is happening. So, tell me, is it possible to get away from people? How is that possible? But is it possible to change them just by being around them? Who gives us that choice? So, what else is there? And where can we find help to deal with them? Something that will let them do what they think is right, but will also let us live in peace with nature. 
Still, being alone makes you unhappy and dissatisfied. This is known as isolation. But when you're with other people, you call them thieves and schemers. There are times when you blame your parents, kids, family, and even your neighbors. You should call being alone peace and freedom and compare yourself to the gods when you're by yourself. When there are a lot of people together, you shouldn't call them a crowd, a mob, or an unpleasantness. Instead, you should call them a party or a fair. So, be happy about everything. Then what do you do with people who don't accept things as they are? If a man doesn't like being alone, leave him alone. He doesn't like his parents, so let him whine and be a bad kid. He doesn't like his kids, so let him be a bad parent and jail him. Which jail do you mean? He doesn't want to be where he is now, but he is, and anyone who is somewhere against their will is in jail. In this way, Socrates wasn't in jail because he chose to be there. 2. Being free from mental pain. What good do these stoic ideas lead to? What should be the best and most proper result for people who are really learning? Peace, freedom, and not being afraid of anything. We shouldn't believe the many people who say that only the free can get an education. Instead, we should believe the philosophers who say that only the learned are free. What does this mean to you? So, think about what freedom means to you now. Isn't it just the freedom to live our lives however we want? Of course. So, tell me, do you want to live in error? We don't. That's correct. People who are wrong are not free. Do you want to live in fear, sadness and trouble? Without a doubt not. That means that no one who is scared, sad or upset is free. However, the same thing that frees someone from sadness, fear and trouble also frees them from slavery. Third, freedom from having to obey others. Do you believe that freedom is a greet? good and important thing. Yes, of course. Is it possible to be humble when you get something so great, useful and good? It's not. There is a good chance that someone is not free when you see them groveling to someone else or praising him in a fake way. If someone acts this way for small reasons, like a poor meal, or even if they want to be governor or president, call them minor slaves. Call those who act this way for bigger reasons slaves, which is what they deserve. You're right once more. Do you believe that freedom is something that a person can choose for themselves? Yes, of course. So, you can say with certainty that no one is free as long as someone else can stop and force them. Also, don't look into his family tree or see if he's ever been bought or sold. But if you hear him say yes sir to himself and with feeling, you should call him a slave, even if he comes with a group of foreign officials. And if you hear him say, poor me, what will I have to go through? Do not call him a slave. To put it simply, call him a slave if you see him crying, whining and being sad. Address for work. If he doesn't do any of these things though, don't set him free just yet. Instead, Look at his decisions to see if they can be changed by force, delay, or unhappiness. What if you think he is like that? Tell him he is a slave on vacation at the Saturnalia and that his master is not around. He will be back soon, and then you will know what this man is going through. Who is going to return? The man wants everyone in charge of anything to either get it for him or take it away from him. Then do we have so many masters? Yes, before people, we have masters in the form of situations, and there are a lot of them. Because of this, anyone who has power over us must also be our boss. So you see, people don't fear Caesar himself. They fear death, deportation, losing their property, going to jail, and losing their citizenship. Much the same, Caesar is not loved by anyone unless he is a truly great person. What we love are money and high positions in the military or government. There must be someone in charge of the things we love, hate and fear, because those things are controlled by them. 4. The freedom to climb without any problems. 
Is it possible for someone to want something that other people can do without any problems? It's not. Are there any ways for them to be free? It's not. That's why they can't be free either. Think about it. Is there anything that only we can do, or is it always like that? Or do some things depend on us, and some on other people? What do you mean? When you want your body to be healthy, is that your choice or not? I have nothing to do with it. And that wasn't good for your health either when you wanted it. And again, when you wanted to look good, no. Not when you want to live or die either. Because of this, your body is not your own. It depends on everything that is bigger than it. Okay, thanks. For how long do you get to keep the land? Is it up to you to keep it in any state you want? It's not. Also, none of these things were true for slaves, clothes, a house, or horses. What if you want your kids, your wife, your brother, or your friends to live more than anything else? Is that up to you? They're not. So, do you not have anything that you can choose for yourself? Something that is only up to you? I'm not sure. Take a look at it this way and think about it. Can someone force you to agree with something that isn't true? Not anyone. Can someone force you to believe something that isn't true? Not anyone. As far as this goes, do you see that your will is not limited or stopped? Okay, so is it different when it comes to want and drive? Is it possible to get past a reason that isn't another drive? What else but another desire or aversion can beat a desire or an aversion? However, if someone threatens me with death, they do have my attention. Not the danger itself, but your choice that it is better to do something else than to die is what drives you. So, once more, it was your decision that made you do it. In other words, will drove will. Because if God had made his own special part that he gave us so that it could be limited by himself or something else, he would no longer be God and would not be caring for us as he should. You are free if you want to be. Nobody will be blamed or accused if you want it to be that way. Everything will be right in God's eyes and your own. 5. Using thoughts in the right way. This world has given us many qualities that are only needed in logical beings. But as you will see, we also have a lot in common with animals that can't think or reason. Do they also notice what's going on? Not at all. To use something and to pay attention are two very different things. As creatures that use their impressions, God needed the other animals. But he also needed us as creatures that think about how we use our impressions. Because of this, it is enough for them to eat, drink, rest, mate, and do all the other things that animals do. These animal actions are no longer enough for us though, because God has also given us the ability to pay attention. But we won't be able to reach our goals unless we act in a way that is proper, orderly, and in line with who we are as individuals. Beings with different makes-ups also have different goals and roles. People whose constitution is meant to be used alone only need to use that constitution. People who can pay attention, on the other hand, will never reach their goals if they don't know how to use this skill properly. How does that then happen? God made all the other animals so that people could eat them, use them in farms, make cheese, or do something similar. Why do they need to be able to pay attention to and tell the difference between feelings in order to do these things? God, on the other hand, made people to study him and his works, and not just study them, they were also meant to explain them. Because of this, it is wrong for us to start and end where animals do, since animals are not logical. They should start where we do, but nature should stop where we do. What nature left us with was the ability to study and pay attention to things and live in peace with itself. So, make sure you don't die before you've learned these things. 8. Freedom and the way people are. No one else in the world can pay attention to the divine rule because they were all left behind. Animals that are able to think and reason 
can, however, come to the conclusion that they are a part of the world, albeit a certain kind of part, and that it is okay for the parts to give way to the whole. Also, because they are good, smart, and free by nature, they know that they live in a world where some things can go as planned and are up to them, while other things can get in the way and are up to other people. This type of thing is part of the will, while the second type of thing is outside of it and can get in the way. Therefore, if rational animals only focus on the first type of good and interest, the things that they can control and do themselves, they will be free, happy, safe, spiritual, respectful, thankful to God for everything, and never blame others or find fault with what happened. If, on the other hand, they connect their good and interests with things that are outside of their will, they will be stifled and irritated, and they will have to listen to those who control the things they admire and fear. They are also almost certainly disrespectful because they believe that God is angry with them and unfair because they always want more for themselves. They aren't likely to have self-respect or kindness. What's stopping you from living a free and easy life, being calm about everything that could happen and putting up with what has already happened? Would you like me to be poor? As long as a good actress plays the part, you will learn what it means to be poor. Do you want me to be president? Go for it. Would you like me to leave the office? Also, bring that on. Do you want me to go through pain? Also, bring them on. And being sent away. I will be okay no matter where I go because I was okay here because of my beliefs, which I will take with me. They are mine and no one can take them away. They are the only things I own that I can't lose and are enough for me no matter where I am or what I do. But now is the time for you to die. What does it mean to say to die? Do not turn it into a sad business. Tell it like it is. It is now time for the stuff that makes you up to go back to where it came from. What's so bad about that? What kind of things is the world going to lose? What is going to happen that no one has ever heard of? Is this why the tyrant scares us? Is this why the God's swords look so long and sharp? Let other people handle that. I've looked into everything and found that no one has power over me. I am free because of God. I know what he wants me to do. No longer can anyone make me their slave. The person who frees me and the judges who rule me are the right ones. 9. Freedom and Honor you should think about the powers you have and then say, Bring on now, O Zeus, whatever you like, because you have given me the tools and resources to set myself apart through the things that happen. You don't blame the gods. Instead, you sit there shaking with fear of what might happen and crying, wailing and groaning over what is happening, because the weakness you show is nothing but religious folly. However, God has not only given us these powers so that we can handle everything that happens without being embarrassed or crushed by it. He has also given them to us freely, like a good king or a true father. He made them all up for us, not even giving himself the power to stop or slow them down. Given that these powers are free and yours alone, why not use them and be aware of the gifts you have gotten and the person who gave them to you? So instead of sitting there crying and grumbling, 